Hey Code Crew, it's Chris here back again with another Swift UI tutorial. Today we're going to dive even deeper into Swift UI and we're going to look at how to display lists of data in your view. Now, if you've used the UI kit before in the past, we've done this with the UI table view element. However, in Swift UI, it's a little different. You're also going to learn how to show a second view and navigate from the first view to the second view. And yes, you're also going to learn how to pass data between them. Sound good? All right, stay tuned. All right, so by the end of this tutorial, you will have built something that looks like this. Now, I know this looks like the one that we built in the first part, but take a look at this. We get a whole list of landmarks now, and when you click on each one, it's actually dynamic. You get a detailed view of that place with a map of that place and a picture of that place. And obviously this demo builds upon the one that we built in the last lesson. So if you haven't gone through that yet, I highly recommend that you do that first. And again, like I mentioned in the previous lesson, these tutorials are based off of Apple's own awesome Swift UI tutorials. This particular one is called building lists and navigation. And if you go down, you're going to see that there are a couple of distinct sections. So let me just go through a quick preview of what we're going to talk about in this lesson. So they're gonna start us off with a sample project. It's gonna have sample data already of the different landmarks. We're going to create a view for each of those rows. Well, actually, we're gonna create one row view, but we're going to use it for all of those places. Uh, we're gonna be able to customize the preview. So remember in the last lesson, I told you that uh, there are two structs in each view. The first struct describes the content in the layout, whereas the second struct actually dictates what you see on the right side preview. And this gives you the flexibility to manipulate the preview to see only the parts you want because you might not be working on the full view, so you don't need to see the full thing. So in this part, uh, we're gonna show you how to customize that preview so you only look at the part that you want to. And then we're going to dive into the meat of the lesson, which is creating the list of landmarks. And this is what you saw back here with kind of the scrollable list that looks like a table view if you're familiar with the old way or the UI kit way of building lists. And then of course it's gonna be static at first and then we're going to make it dynamic with the data. And then we're going to set up some navigation between that list and the detail view, which we built in the previous lesson. So you kind of need to have that built. Uh, we're gonna look at how to pass data between the two views. And then lastly, this section generating previews dynamically, you're gonna learn how to preview your view in different device sizes. So if that all sounds good, let's dive in. But actually one thing, if you haven't hit that like button yet or you're not subscribed to the channel, please do, it really helps out my channel and it lets me know that you guys wanna see more Swift UI tutorials. So if that sounds good, please give this video a like and subscribe. All right, let's do this. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to go to this tutorial, um, link in the description, and go ahead and download the project files because it's going to start us off with a starter project that's going to contain some of the files that we're gonna to need to complete this project, namely the sample data, uh, some helper methods and structs and classes. Now, in this particular Swift UI tutorial, it only focuses on the Swift UI part and it doesn't really explain all the stuff that's in the starter project, but don't worry, I'm gonna go through that stuff with you guys, just in case you're not familiar with some of the things that they're doing in there already. So I've already got the file downloaded. It's this one, building lists and navigation.zip. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that. And it's gonna have two folders, complete and starting point. And obviously you're gonna to wanna to grab the starting point one. Let's go ahead and open up that. Um, actually, I'm gonna do it through the Xcode 9 beta, all the, so it doesn't get confused as to which version, because I have both versions on here. So let's go into desktop, sample apps, uh, this one right here, starting point, uh, landmarks, and open up their sample project, yep. All right, so it's gonna start us off like this. So before we dive in and start coding up some UIs, we're gonna take a look at what they have here. And they've organized it really nicely for us in these subfolders. 
So uh, first of all, let's look into resources here. We've got landmarkdata.json. And if you're not familiar with this JSON format, uh, it's basically a format to describe items of data that we're going to use in our app. Let me, let me show you. So this outer square bracket is basically a collection of items. And each item is separated by a comma. So you see a comma here and a comma there. Uh, and each item is surrounded by a pair of curly brackets. And then the data inside uh, is the actual data for that item. So you see we have things like name, category, city, state, ID, park coordinates for the location and the image. Now the images, they're all here in the resources already. So we have all of this set up, ready to go. Um, the problem is that this data in this JSON file is not usable as is. We actually have to process this JSON file and turn it into uh, structs or things that we can use. So that is what inside the model, you have this data file and that's what this is. So let me just close, go editor only. And you can see here uh, that it's got this load function. Now I'm not gonna describe all of this code, but it basically takes that JSON file and breaks it up into a collection of landmark objects that we can use. Uh, and then notice here that they declared this global variable called landmark data, which calls that load function and passes in the JSON file. Right, so this landmark data global variable is going to um, contain that array of landmarks. And if you don't know what an array is, it's just a list of items, um, to put it simply. There's also another image store class here, and this is actually a singleton class. Now, this is going to help us return these images in the sizes that we need. So I'm not gonna dive too far deep into this. It's a lot of code here to do that. Um, but when we finally get to using it, I'll point out to you exactly where, uh, where it comes into play. But for now, we have this data file here. We also have landmark.swift. Now, each of these landmark objects represents one landmark from the data file. Remember how the JSON data file uh, was a collection of landmarks separated by commas? Well, each of those landmarks is gonna be represented by this struct here. So uh, one cool thing I can do for you is do a side-by-side -side comparison of, let's see here, resources, landmark.json. Let me close this, close that. All right, so here's that landmark structure and here's our JSON file. So you can see that it maps, right? We've got the name, it's gonna go into this property right here. We've got a category that's gonna go down here and you can see there's a one-to-one -one mapping. There's an ID, there's ID, uh, image name and coordinates, image name and coordinates, and then park and state, park and state. All right, so that's really cool. Now let's go back to the file navigator. All right, so let's go ahead and open that, close that dual window. We've got uh, the app delegate, the scene delegate, I described this stuff back in the previous lesson, so take a look at that if you're not sure what these are. Uh, here is landmark detail.swift. Now this is actually the thing that we created in part one. This is that Turtle Rock Joshua Tree National Park detail view. So let's just preview it to make sure that it looks correct. Otherwise, we'll, we're gonna be building off of a wrong base already. So it's gonna take a while. All right. Under supporting views, while that happens, I'm not gonna click away from it, we also have circle image and map view. So these are two views that we built in the previous lesson that are used in the landmark detail view. You can see that this is the circle image and this is the map view. Um, they're used in this to build out the overall detail view. So you can see there, um, the map's not showing up because we're not in live preview, but if I turn that on, you're gonna see it go to Turtle Rock. All right, so that's what we've got starting out. Now let's dive in and start building our row. I'm going to do this under the supporting views group because this is a single row in a larger list. And so I consider that a supporting view. So let's go ahead 
and create a new file right there. And under iOS, choose Swift UI View. So that's what we've been doing for the last little while, right? Landmark row. Let's create that. And let me just show the preview. This is just going to be our basic Hello World UI view, but we're gonna change that. So inside this structure that describes the content and layout, you know, this, this label could, let me change this to, let's say, Turtle Rock, right? Now this would be a static piece of text and we don't want our rows to be static pieces of text. We want them to be dynamic because each row represents some sort of landmark. We're going to store the landmark that this row represents in a property that we're going to declare up here. So let's declare a new property called landmark and it's going to be of type landmark. All right, at this point, if you try to run it, uh, it's going to fail. So you'll notice that now when you try to create a new landmark row object, that this doesn't work anymore. You need to supply the parameter that is going to be set to this landmark property. So why don't we use autocomplete, open up a bracket, hit enter. You can see now that whenever you want to create a new landmark row object, you're going to have to pass in a landmark object to set to this property. So what we're going to do is, uh, you know how I showed you that there was this global variable called landmark data and that this loads the JSON file and parses it and returns to us an array of landmark objects, right? Well, this is exactly what we need. So why don't we access this global variable to pass in so that we have something to show. So I am going to call landmark data and I'm gonna access the first element. Now, this preview is basically going to create a new landmark row. It's gonna pass in the first item in our data set, uh, which is going to be set here. And then finally, for my text element, I can actually access the name property of the landmark that got passed in. So name, and let's see what we get on the right hand side. So you can see here, it says Turtle Rock. Now don't be fooled because I had Turtle Rock there before. Let's say I change this to one, right? You can see now it's Silver Salmon Creek. And the order of these elements corresponds to the order of the data in here in the JSON file. All right, next we're going to add an image beside the name. So let's go back here. Since we have the landmark that we want to show for this row, uh, let's see what else in, is in here. So this landmark actually has an image property which returns to us an image view and we can pass in the size that we want. So let's say 50, let's see how that looks like. Well, actually this is gonna crash. Reason is because if we want to show two elements side by side, remember we have to use an H stack or a horizontal stack view. So let's create one like that and let's just cut and paste these two elements into here. Well, let me just indent this so it's a little easier to read. Ah, oh, I know why it looks so weird. Let's create more space. There we go. So we've got our, let's resume there. We've got our image and we've got our landmark name. So what is this image property? Why don't we go take a look? Hold down command, you can click it. Uh, jump to definition so we can see what this function returns. You can also use that shortcut key right there. So this is our landmark structure. This is the image function and it uses that image store, right? And it uh, accepts a size and then it returns us an image. So this image store is what I pointed out to you earlier inside this data file. Remember here. Uh, image store, this guy. So all of this code right here basically reads the image from here, uh, turns it into the size that we want and returns it. So that's what that res is responsible for. So let's go back to our, where were we here? Landmark row. All right, so we've got an image, we've got the text, but it's kind of centered, right? And we want our rows to stretch for the whole uh, width. So let's close that. I'm gonna add a spacer 
at the back here. Now that's cool, it's going to push it all the way to the edges like that. Um, now I am going to change the preview because after all, we are working on a single row here, right? And what we see on the preview is like this giant screen, this whole view, we don't need that. We just need to look at a single row. So you can actually modify what we see in terms of the preview. So for example, take a look at this. We can call a method called preview layout and then we can pass in fixed. We want to uh, look at a fixed size for the layout. And for the width, I'm gonna put 300 and the height, I'm gonna put 70. So let's take a look at how that looks like. So here we can focus on a single row. So what's even cooler is that I can actually preview a couple of different rows or three or four, however many I want by using something called group. So let me declare a new group here. And let me put this row in here, All right? So that's showing my landmark data, the first element. Let me just create some more space. All right. And let's say I want to take a look at another piece of data uh, for my preview so that I can make sure that the view that I'm coding here works for my sample set of data. So here I've created two landmark rows one showing the first item in my JSON data file and the second one showing the first element from my JSON data file. And what I noticed here is that there's actually a couple of margins in the top and bottom. I wanna have a margin on the left as well. And so I can add some padding to my uh, H stack. So I can say the leading edge, let's say 10 like that. So that gives that little bit of padding there. Now to simplify this code, because this is in a group, I can actually apply the preview layout to the entire group instead of to the individual elements inside it. So I'm gonna delete that and I'm going to just call preview layout on the entire group. All right, up next, we're going to see how we can start displaying a list of data now that we have our rows. So let's go back here and let's create a landmark list. So we're going to create a new file and I'm actually going to create it out here because um, this is not going to be a supporting view. It's actually going to uh, be our root view once we're finished with this. So under iOS, let's choose Swift UI view. And then why don't we call this guy landmark list. So I'm going to move it up here. So it's just easier to reference and see. All right. So again, we've got our basic hello world with one text element. So in order to display a list of data, we simply use the list element. So that's as easy as it gets. We call list like that, right? And then we can paste in a couple of landmark rows, right? That's the thing we just created here. So why don't we try that? So landmark, whoops, landmark row. And landmark row, when I try to create a new one, it expects me to pass in a piece of, well, a landmark data, right? Um, a landmark object. So let me just create two rows first so it's easier to see for you. So I've got two landmark rows right here. Um, and inside each one, I'm gonna pass in a different uh, item from our data set. So landmark data element zero and landmark data element one. Let's take a look at what we get right here. So instantly, this preview is so cool. Uh, we can see Turtle Rock and Silver Salmon Creek. So this is cool and all, but this is not exactly what we want, right? Because we're showing two static pieces of information here. And in our collection of landmarks, we actually have a lot more places. And so I don't wanna be hand coding, you know, each row like this. What we want to do instead is actually make our list read off of our location data array. Let's just delete this and we can do that by using one of the initializers of the list, namely this one right here. So we can pass in our location data array. I know this kind of looks like a mess, but not location data. I keep calling it location data, landmark data. Uh, but the problem is that we need to exactly specify what the unique ID that uniquely identifies 
each item is. And luckily for us, for all of our landmarks, we actually have an ID that is meant for exactly this purpose. And you can see in the landmark data.json, we also have the ID and each of them are different as well. So going back here, uh, creating our list right here, uh, landmark data is our collection of data. And then we're gonna call identified by, and here we're gonna specify the property or the key that we wanna use, and that is ID. Now I have to hit backslash uh, because I need to escape the, the dot there. And that's how you specify that you want to use this property as the unique ID. Now for selection, I'm not going to do anything with that. That's an optional parameter. And for the action, again, also, uh, this is a little bit of a mess. Um, I don't have to specify that. But for the row content, I do want to specify this closure. closure. So let me double click that it's going to open up as a trailing closure and this kind of looks, it's really hard to read. All right, so now it's a little more clear and this I just have to specify a parameter. I'm gonna call it landmark. So let me explain what's happening here. So we're creating a brand new list and we are passing in our collection of data, telling it uh, what the unique identifier is so it can tell how many items there are and what items are with what items. For each of those items in the collection, it's going to run the code in our closure right here. This is where we want to return the view to display that specific piece of data that it is looking at, right? Because it's gonna go through this collection. So uh, we basically, in here, we want to return a landmark row. You know the thing that we just built? So we're gonna create a new landmark row. We're gonna to have to pass in the landmark. That's not a problem because we have it as a parameter up here. So I'm just going to specify that. All right, so uh, this says it returns a view, but it actually, we're, we're returning a landmark row to be more specific. So let's replace that right there. And we should be good. Yeah, all right. So you see, it's pretty cool. Now the list is dynamically reading off our, of our data set and producing this list. Now, one more thing I wanna show you is, you know how for our data set here, uh, our list of landmarks, we have to use this identified by and tell it which property to use? Well, we can actually improve that for our landmark structure. If we say that it conforms to the identifiable protocol, and if we just take a look at that. So let me hold down this and you can see that it is a type that you can compare for identity quality. Open it up in developer documentation and let's just take a look here. There's not too much information about it, but what it does say down here is that it is, you need a unique identifier, an ID property here, right? So, we don't really have to do anything else because it has that property right there. And so now that the landmark structure conforms to the identifiable protocol, we no longer have to manually specify this method here. And then we can just specify our collection of landmark objects like that. So now we've got our list of data, but how do we transition from this list to the detail view when someone taps on one of these rows? Well, for that, we need to put our list into what's called a navigation view. And then for each of these items that it generates these rows for, instead of just returning a row, we need to return that row wrapped inside of a navigation button. So that allows the user to tap on it and then we can trigger some sort of destination for that button. So let me show you how that's done. So first of all, we're going to declare a navigation view. Uh, and then all we have to do is put our list inside of it. So that takes care of that. But the second issue is that we need to wrap our landmark row in a navigation button. So navigation button here, and we are going to create an instance of it. Now, there are a whole bunch of different initializers for this navigation button, but 
um, as I was learning Swift UI through the Apple tutorials, I noticed that all we needed, at least for this particular case anyways, was to specify a destination. Um, so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to choose this one. I'm gonna get rid of the label. I don't quite fully understand how the navigation button works yet, but I'm sure in time as I dig more into Swift UI, I'll learn. Um, but for now, if we specify the landmark detail view, if we create a new instance of it right here, like that, when this navigation button triggers, it's going to send the user to the landmark detail view. And then this is how we would wrap this landmark row inside this navigation button. Now, I, I was encountering this error here and it's basically saying that right here we're returning a navigation button, um, but up here for this closure, we are specifying landmark row. And then what I eventually realized is that we don't need to specify a return type actually at all. So if we leave it like that, everything's gonna be good. And then inside here, we can try and run it again. Uh, let's go live preview mode. All right, and if we tap on one of these, we can go to the detail view. There's a back button and we can choose a different one, but you notice how they are all turtle rock, right? No matter what I choose, it's showing turtle rock. And that is because inside the landmark detail view, we have these hard coded values, right? It's set to um, this particular text here, the circle image itself is hard coded to this image and the map view itself is hard coded to this coordinate for Turtle Rock. So actually, if we want to make it dynamic, we need to update this landmark detail, right? It's got to keep track of a particular landmark that it wants to display. And then we have to pass in the coordinates into the map view that we wanted to show. We need to pass in the image into the circle image view that we want to show. And we need to pass in the landmarks name, park, state into all of these fields here to make it dynamic. So let's take a look at how we're going to make this happen. So this is the landmark detail. Why don't we go up one level and we go to the landmark list. So here's what we want to do. This is the list that is showing each landmark from the collection of landmarks. For each single landmark, it is showing a row, right? And this row, uh, we made it dynamic by passing in the landmark that it wants to show and then it's showing that landmark's picture and that landmark's name. That's exactly what we need to do here as well for the landmark detail. That's, and that's gonna make it so that when they tap on Twin Lake, they're gonna get the landmark detail for Twin Lake, right? Icy Bay, they're gonna get the landmark detail for Icy Bay. So essentially, we wanna change the landmark detail so that we can pass a landmark inside. So why don't we now drill down to landmark detail and see how we can make that happen. So the first thing I would do is create a new landmark property here, right? So that we make it so that when we declare a landmark detail, we need to pass in the landmark that we want it to show what landmark do we want the detail for, right? We need to specify that. So now, because I've added this landmark property here, whenever you create a new landmark detail object, you need to specify the value for that. So right now in this preview, I'm going to just put in some uh, piece of dummy data. We're gonna say uh, landmark data, let's say element number three, just for sample data purpose. Right, you're not gonna really see anything change here. You know why? Because all we're doing when we pass in landmark data three here is we're setting this property to landmark the third data element. But the map view is still hard coded to those coordinates. The circle image is still hard coded to this image and all of this text is still hard coded. So the first thing we can do actually is we can change this text, right? So instead of hard coding that we can show landmark dot name, right? That's 
from this property up here. All right, so that's already going to be dynamic. Uh, let's resume. Build failed. Ah, that's because that's because now that we've added this landmark, um, we need to go back to the landmark list, right? This navigation button, this is no longer valid. We can't just create a landmark detail. We need to specify which landmark we need that to, all right, so let's do that. Um, and then we're gonna pass in landmark, just like we're doing here for the row. All right, so that should be good. Build failed again. Ah, so here in scene delegate, again, we need to, uh, the root view is landmark detail, right? When you launch the app, it's gonna show landmark detail. And again, that's no longer enough. We need to specify a piece of dummy data for now. So eventually we're gonna to want to change this to show the list as the root view. Actually, why don't we do that right now? We're going out of order a little bit. So we're going to show the landmark list as the root view for when the app launches. So that's eventually what we want to do anyways. All right, so this is in the scene delegate. All right, let's just save it and let's hit command B and build it. Make sure it all runs. And let's go back to landmark detail. All right, so this is where we're at here. We've got the landmark property being passed in and I am updating these hard-coded strings to show the values from the landmark that is passed in. So this would be the park and this would be, oh, let's resume. This would be the state, landmark.state. And so I wanna see those values update right there. So regenerating. All right, so we've got St. Mary Lake, Glacier, Glacier National Park and Montana. And this comes from this piece of sample data that I supplied for the preview. Now we need to update the coordinates and the circle image. So we wanna make it so that we can pass in the landmark, right, into the map view and pass in the landmark into the circle image to let it know what it should be displaying. So why don't we do the map view first? Let's drill in, jump into the definition for the map view here. And up here, we are going to declare a variable, or a property rather, for the coordinate. And this is going to be CL location coordinate 2D. And this is basically going to replace this line of code. So we don't have to hard code these coordinates. So why don't we erase that? All right, so now in the preview, we're missing the parameter, right, for declaring the map view because we just added that stored property. So now we have to specify a coordinate, right? Uh, I'm going to specify a sample. So landmark data, let's do the first piece and we're gonna say lo location coordinate like that. Okay, so that, that's gonna be Turtle Rock. That's the first element. Um, but that's all we need to do for the map view. So now it expects us to pass in the coordinates that we wanted to hone in on. All right, so now let's go into the circle image. And up here, let's look for an image. Um, let's create an image property right there. So whenever we create a new circle image view, it requires us to pass in the image that we want it to show. So no longer are we gonna show a hard-coded turtle rock image. We are going to show the image that is set here. All right, so circle image. Now for this preview, we can't just declare a new circle image. We need to pass in uh, an actual image. So I'm going to grab, I keep doing that, landmark data. I'm going to grab let's, the first element or second element rather, uh, because then array starts at zero. So the first element is zero, second element is one. So I'm going to grab element, the second element, and then I'm going to call the image. And the size of this was 250, and I know that. So when we run this, missing ah, so it doesn't build right now because 
in the landmark detail, we have to supply the parameters when we create the new map view and the new circle image. So let's fix that first. All right, so this is the landmark detail. We've already dynamically set the landmark name, park, state, and we've just modified the map view and the circle image to accept the coordinates and the actual image file here. So let us call the new initializer. We're going to pass in the landmark dot coordinate location coordinate. And for circle image, we are going to pass in the landmark dot image for size 250. And we're going to resume. So just wait for it. Boom. Is that map that map going to update? Yeah, it should update. There we go. Cool. So now we can go back to our list because everything's dynamic. Now we've changed circle image to accept the image map view to accept the coordinate uh, landmark detail to accept the landmark. And we've already updated the landmark list right here when we show the row and we create the navigation button, we're passing in the landmark to the landmark detail. So now if I tap on any of these, all right, let me, come on. Um, let me try to get out of this preview and I'm gonna try and get back into the preview. So you can see there's still some things to work out, but there we go. Turtle Rock, Chillicook Trail, and all of this is dynamic and it's passing the data from the list to the detail view, which is really, really cool. Now there is one thing I forgot to show you guys, which is basically to set the navigation bar titles. So in this navigation view, uh, you can actually call this uh, navigation bar title here and then you can pass in a text view and that's going to show up landmarks that's going to show up up there let's see if we can see that mm, not really i don't really know where that's supposed to show up to be honest all right you know what we're going to try to Launch it in the simulator and see what happens. All right, so we've got our iPhone 10s on iOS 13. All right, so we don't have a navigation title here either. So I don't really know where it shows up. If you guys know, let me know in the comment section below. Ah, I did something wrong. I crashed it. I wonder what happened there. Yeah, keep in mind this is all beta software. Everything's in beta, so. Don't expect everything to work perfectly. However, in the landmark detail, I actually, in here, could probably set a navigation. Uh, so we're gonna do that here. Navigation bar title display mode. Uh, maybe that's what we needed, a display mode. So. This one, uh, we're gonna make this one dynamic, right? Because I'm passing the landmark name because this is the detail view. And then for the display mode, uh, let's say inline. And let's see if we can see that landmark detail. It's not showing me the right preview for the right view that I'm looking at. Come on, I think it's it's basically given up on me. Oh, there we go. Mm, I'm gonna run it. Oh, it's got an app icon and everything too. Ah, there it is, Turtle Rock, cool. Yeah, so maybe this list here, we have to, if we wanted to show it, you know, we could uh, change this to what was it display mode um, dot inline let's run it nope 
Well, ah oh well. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do now, um, I promise to also show you how you can preview it on different devices here. So you can see here on the landmark list, we are just showing it. Um, but if you call the display uh, preview, sorry, preview device, come on, auto complete, there we go. Uh, we basically pass in, we create a new preview device and we pass in the raw value. And this, this string, I don't know where they get this from, but it, it is basically something like this. Let's see if that works. All right, so finally, I wasn't even looking and it changed, cool. So there's also a way to preview your preview on multiple devices at the same time. Now, I'm not gonna show you the code here, but if you're interested, just follow the link in the description to the Apple Swift UI tutorial that this video tutorial is based off of. If you go all the way to the bottom, um, you're gonna see the snippet of code that they use to show multiple device previews at the same time. Now I wanna turn it over to you. Did you install any of the betas on your machines? I know in the past that I never install Apple beta software on my machines, um, but when they announced Swift UI, I just couldn't not install it. So I bit the bullet and went ahead and did it. So far so good, I haven't noticed any big problems. Let me know what your experience has been by leaving a quick comment below. If you like this video, please hit like and please subscribe to the channel as that sort of stuff really helps me and helps the channel grow. And if you want to see more, well, there's more Swift UI content right there. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next lesson.